So again, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, in this particular segment, uh, we we're going to hone down uh, on what I think, um, and my research shows me, is a world first. Uh, and I've set off to the BIE a request that they uh, approach Laurie to actually write an article because I think it's this significant in the history of uh, world expositions um, that a landscaping technology and package uh, was brought into being um, for the Queensland Pavilion and is a, a little known and little appreciated uh, fact. So green walls, Laurie, um, you heard me bang on about uh, the fact that, um, you know, green walls are an amazing uh, technology um, and you, in actual fact, were the person that brought them into being. Um, so I'm just hoping that you can... So we've heard about the Epiphyte Forest. Just Can you just explain to me some of... or just explain to the audience some of the challenges um, that you faced in, in watering the poles, uh, in providing the microclimates? I mean, you must have had to analyse where the sun fell, how hot it was going to be, so that these various epiphytes thrived in their particular location. I mean, the attention to detail must have been amazing. That was the very important integral part of the whole design of the forest because um, with the 60 poles being arrayed around the precinct there under the sunshade uh, sails, there were sections of, and they were so high that um, they weren't all under the sun sails. Some of them were out just on the edge and uh, out in the full sun and exposed to the wind and everything. Others were very, very protected. And uh, so you had everything from full protection right through to full exposure. And so that immediately allowed us to make a, a very careful selection of what species we used on all of these poles. And primarily um, they were Queensland rainforest species, but it also allowed us to uh, bring in international rainforest species too, because we wanted to describe the fact that rainforest is not only in Queensland, but it's around the world in the Amazon and so on. And so we were able to use species like bromeliads and those sorts of plants uh, that come from other climatic regions of the planet. And so it, it was all brought together and they were located in the correct pole position, whether it was up at the top, 16 metres above the ground or whether it was right down close to ground level where it was very protected and so on. Um, okay, that's one thing. So we had to uh, work all of that out and do a complete microclimatic analysis um, for the six months of Expo just to understand the sun penetration and the wind penet penetration through that precinct and, and that dictated, um, you know, just how to go with the plant selection. So that's fine. Now we had 16 poles, how are we going to do that? Because the, these big steel poles had to be erected, first of all. Um, and so then we uh, had to create a whole series of cylinders. In fact, there were more than 700 cylinders of mesh. And uh, they were around about a metre uh, or 900 millimetres diameter. Um, and it was a double skin of uh, mesh, galvanised mesh. And uh, they were... Uh, each of them around about um, 900 millimetres high. So um, each one of those was numbered for its pole and its position on the pole, from ground level right to the top. And, uh, and all the plants were established on them. Now between those two sections of um, mesh, uh, which were apart by about um, 100 millimetres, um, that was filled with sphagnum moss. Uh, which is a natural moss that absorbs moisture and the, the roots of the plant material could get into that. And uh, so that was all uh, filled that way and compacted as the, uh, the plants were installed. Now, as well as that, we put in some uh, irrigation lines uh, through this, which um, you know, dripped water onto them um, cylinder by cylinder by cylinder as you went right up the pole. Um, and they're all computer controlled, uh, the irrigation, so you don't overwet them. 
Uh, and also there were other things that went in at that time too, were the cables that were needed for the misting effects, the lighting cables, and, uh, and, and also uh, one or two other things that were there for security and whatnot. Um, so rather complex. So in the nurseries there, they had these, um, this vast array of these uh, cylinders in the sun or the shade, wherever they had to be, so they could be grown on for the next two to three years to be at pristine position, uh, condition when they're brought to the site. So, okay, um, maybe about uh, a month or six weeks before opening day, uh, the cylinders were brought and then craned up to the top and then dropped over in sequence by their numbers uh, over each pole and connected together and then finally connected to the whole computerized technological system. Um, so it was quite, quite a, a task as you can imagine in the whole planning and design and erection process as well. And, uh, and so then it was all connected together and it took, you know, I don't know, now best part of uh, three, two or three weeks, I think, to install them all. And, uh, yeah, and I bet, anybody, well. and, I bet uh, anybody when you first turned it on, it didn't quite work. Oh, that was that was that was later on. <laughs> oh, yeah, that was oh, that that was amazing. I'll never forget that. This was about um, you know three or four nights before opening day, and um, John Truscott and I were there along with the team of everybody, just connecting up all of the special lighting and the fogging and, and the projection on the sun sails and all of those, oh, and the, the sound systems as well, because we had birds and frogs and, and so on in there. And, and that was interesting because with the sound system, it was at three levels. The lower level was frogs and, and ground dwelling birds. The middle level was the, uh, the uh, magpies and peewees and those sorts of birds there. And the top level was the kookaburras and the parrots and the crows and things, so that you got this three-dimensional surround sound as well as all, everything else. Um, but anyway, that, that, that three nights before, we turned it all on and uh, just nothing went right. It just, all night they were trying, the technicians were trying to fix connections and do this, that and the other thing. And I remember about three o'clock in, in the morning, um, finally, John Truscott was beside me and, and we're both directing what could happen. And he just <laughs> gave out this loud roar and he, and, he, and he was just so distraught that nothing's going to go wrong. And so he collapsed on my shoulder and he said, Larry, it's never going to happen. We can't do it. It's not going to happen. <laughs> anyway, with that, all the rest of the, the staff got busy, busier than ever they were and connected it all properly, I suppose, and fixed whatever was wrong and away it went. And it went for six months like that. It was magic. And uh, so it, it, it was the technological aspect. The plants were fine. Uh, it was just the technology that just took that little bit of twiddling to, to get it working. And, uh, and that was you know, a whole magic thing. I mean, so. it, it, John Truscott uh, drove the development of the lighting uh, with Paradigm, the 100-foot uh, high uh, stainless steel sculpture, which ended up having 66 aircraft landing lights flashing to a computerized pattern. And that was absolutely the very first sculpture in the world that ever had a computerized lighting system in it. And so, you know, the green wall that you ended up developing, it obviously must have been the very first computerized watering, lighting and sound system ever in the world. Yeah, well, I tend to agree. I, I, obviously, at the time when we were designing it, we didn't set out to, uh, to do that, uh, to, you know, to make it world class, if you like, although I suppose we, we did. But there was no time to do any research to see just what else had been done around the world because we were, we were doing this from first principles to just get the inspiration from our rainforest and, uh, and then make it, make it happen. And, you know, thinking back now, it, it must have been world breaking at the time because. Um, while there are plenty of, I, I like to use the word vertical garden as opposed to green wall in, in relation to the episode forest because that's what it really is. There, there's six, you know, 60 vertical gardens that, um, that we had there. And, um, and of course, you just open them out and you've got a green wall and the same technology would apply. And uh, I mean, 
vertical gardens go way back in history, you know, the hanging gardens of Babylon and, and, and everything ever since then. And today around the world, <clears throat> green walls and vertical gardens are, are really coming to the fore because of the way that our cities are becoming ever taller and more crowded. No room for greenery unless we dress up the walls as, as uh, is, is happening and, and it's wonderful. And, and I just like to think that um, we had a small role at Expo 88, maybe a large role, in showing how you can uh, use technology to get green walls in places where you would otherwise not even contemplate trying to establish them. Well, Laurie, that was really great. Thank you.